Hi there! I've been intermittently working on a series of videos covering different world-building aspects of the A Song of Ice and Fire Game of Thrones world. This is one about epidemics and quarantine in Westeros, particularly some new content we got in Martin's recent prequel anthology Fire and Blood. The upcoming Game of Thrones prequel TV show House of the Dragon is going to adapt material from that, so some of the epidemics I'm talking about are going to happen in House of the Dragon. The issue that piqued my interest is that since the Targaryen Conquest 300 years before the War of the Five Kings, Westeros has been hit by three large epidemics. The first question raised is, why is it that they don't seem to have had large epidemics before that? This seemed to be a new phenomenon that caught them off guard. The second is, the last of these epidemics that Martin wrote about curiously didn't have rulers attempting to enact quarantines, even though they did in the other ones he wrote, in cities like King's Landing, putting a quarantine in place. So I'm not sure if George R. R. Martin purposefully intended these patterns or if it's a happy circumstance that they actually seem to make sense in the order that they made events happen. That the earlier epidemics didn't have quarantines, but the later ones did, as if they learned from their mistakes. Now, I'm not sure if I'm reading into it, you know, not the first time this has happened, that, oh no, this is fans overthinking it, but then Martin goes, oh, actually, that's a pretty good idea, and it becomes ascended fan, and I'm not sure, but I, I think he planned this out, because it makes a lot of sense. Well, the first question is pretty straightforward. Martin's new prequel anthology, Fire and Blood, came out in November of 2018, and it covers the first half of the rule of the Targaryen dynasty starting with the conquest 300 years ago and ending about 150 years ago. It was a good stopping point in the narrative. And he said he's not going to get to the second one until if or when he ever finishes the main novels. It's, he'd already dashed off these prequel novellas. He said, you know, I might as well release them as a compendium called Fire and Blood. It's the first half of that. So 300 years ago stops 150 years ago, neatly the first half. And in this new anthology... He described for the first time this massive epidemic that gutted the Seven Kingdoms called the Shivers. Because it was a fever, you, you shivered uncontrollably until you died, you could die within a day from it. A healthy man could wake up one morning and be dead the next. And it just devastated the Seven Kingdoms. There's these very evocative chapters on the Shivers Plague. It struck 60 years after the Targaryen Conquest when Aegon Targaryen I, who forged the Iron Throne, the plague struck during the long and peaceful reign of Aegon's grandson, Jaehaerys. So, three generations later. We had never heard about this before in any of the backstory given in other books. This is a new idea Martin came up with between 2014 or so and 2018. The shivers came in the middle of a long and brutal winter and resulted in mass casualties across all of Westeros, not just with commoners, a lot of great lords died from it. Prentice Tully, Lord of the Riverlands, Lyman Lannister, Lord of the Westerlands, Bertrand Tyrell, Lord of the Reach. Uh, the Baratheons got hit too. Not the Lord, he, he didn't get sick, but his children got it, though they were some of the rare few who survived, but uh, the brother of Lord Baratheon died from it. So a lot of the great houses got hit by this, and as with most epidemics, the major cities were hit the worst, such as Lannisport, Old Town, and worst of all, King's Landing. Old Town lost about a quarter of its population, and we don't have an exact figure, but it's said it was worse in King's Landing. A half of the king's small council died, along with two of the king's guard and even Jaehaerys' eldest daughter. The High Septon also died, that is, their pope, along with a lot of the faith's high clergy. The maesters never conclusively figured out where the shivers came from. It, it did start in major ports, then work its way inland, so it clearly came from some other land. It wasn't native to Westeros. 
and was brought there from somewhere else. They had no idea where. It's not as if they heard of other outbreaks of it in the Free Cities or Slavers Bay or something. So they're not sure where it came from, just that it was a foreign disease. Uh, the first cases in Westeros came in the ports of Blackwater Bay, such as King's Landing, but then it spread everywhere, inland, not just the ports, everywhere. And they suspected it was uh, spread by plague rats, the little black ones that travel on ships from port to port. But the maesters themselves never conclusively proved that. Uh, but because it was at least clear that it didn't come from Westeros, this foreign disease epidemic inevitably led to a wave of xenophobia and mob attacks on foreign merchants. King Jaehaerys' own master of coin, Rigo Draz, was a Pentoshi merchant who had been living in King's Landing for many years while he served on the small council, but a starving mob swarmed him in the street and bashed his head in, uh, killing him, while shouting, quote, He's a Pentoshi! Them's the bastards that brung the shivers here! So, mob attacks on foreigners like that, all the usual pointing fingers and stuff, on top of this, the people who had the highest ratio of getting the Shivers Plague were, of course, you know, those that we would call emergency first responders. You know, doctors and police. So the maesters, or the professional order of uh, medical doctors and medicine men that served the noble houses, something like a third of the maesters died from it, from being close proximity to sick people. And in King's Landing... This had more devastating effects. In King's Landing, the commander of the city watch died, along with so many of the city guardsmen that uh, they ceased to exist as a functional organization, and public order in King's Landing totally collapsed. That there weren't any police or guardsmen, it just collapsed. And the city just descended into near anarchy for a while. The royal family and their surviving household guards were holed up in the Red Keep, but as for the rest of the city, well, on top of being this epidemic, it was in the middle of a hard winter, so snows were so thick that there's these descriptions of the streets being buried under unpassable snowdrifts because there weren't any healthy people left to clear them, so many major streets were truly impassable. And, you know, because no one was clearing icicles off, like you could be killed by falling icicles the size of swords. That the, the city was covered in, in this winter of death from the Shivers Plague. And on top of that, because so many workers and, you know, farmers were, were dead, the, there was no one left to harvest all the crops, so famine conditions set in on top of that. So Martin paints a vivid picture of this apocalyptic plague city, this snowy apocalypse during the Shivers Plague. And there weren't even, it wasn't that there were rioters sweeping through the streets, it's just it was quiet, but every now and then people would raid out of whatever house they were holed up in, climbing over snowdrifts to attack another house for food, but worried that they might get sick, attacking people they came across, fearful they'd catch the Shivers. It was a bad time. So, I could go on, but the Shivers isn't just mentioned in a page. It's a substantial portion of a major chapter in Fire and Blood is devoted to describing the Shivers Plague. And it's great stuff, and if you haven't read it yet, the Fire and Blood paperback edition comes out this May, two months from now. So if you want to get a head start on stuff that will be in House of the Dragon, check out the paperback if you haven't already gotten the original. Um, oh, side note. <laughs> Uh, exactly one year ago, back in March 2019, I had influenza for the first time ever. I'd never experienced what it's like to have influenza before, or a major fever disease like that. Which was annoying because I had the vaccine shot that year, but my doctor explained to me that, well, vaccines don't always work. It was, it was, the strain changed. And it was, when this happened, it hit me really hard. It was only about three months after Fire and Blood was released. So when I went on Twitter and stuff, the way I described it was, I have the shivers. Because we were all, everyone had just been reading it over on my Twitter feed. Um, 
And it was kind of fascinating in a way because you know, I had never had influenza in my entire life. You know, I've, and I've read about, you know, in you know medieval fantasy books and other things, oh, disease was sweeping the land, and this is what it's like to have a fever from that, and you're so incapacitated. It never really happened to me before. It was an abstraction that I'd only heard described. So it was this really weird disconnect where, you know, your brain becomes convinced that you're freezing in order to charge your metabolism into generating a higher body heat, you know, a fever to fight the infection. So internally, you have the profound feeling that your insides are really cold. You feel like you're outside in the middle of a winter night and it's freezing. But if you touch your own arm, you're burning up. You know, it's actually to the point it was hurting me to touch my own arm. It was very uncomfortable. And it's just this disconnect from two different sets of nerve sensations that I'm holding my arm and my brain is telling me both from my internal senses that it's freezing like ice, but the nerves in my other hand are sensing, no, this is a really hot object. It's just so weird that you can do that. Um, the two conflicting sets of sensations. Um, and the other thing is, I've only ever read about people having fever dreams in books, that when you get a high fever, it gets to the point that it makes your, your mind incoherent, that your brain can't function that well when it's you know, that hot. So I was hovering in and out of consciousness for a time at night. The, the fever dreams, you know, I've heard that, that, that as a phrase, I'd never experienced it. It was quite a thing. It was pretty frightening. It's, it's like you're trying to claw your way up out of a heavy blanket back into consciousness. And so, so my mind was just incoherent for a couple of days before I got treated. And two weeks after I got better, if you look at these screenshots of the tweet through I made about it, two weeks after I got better, I didn't even remember that I had said any of this stuff on Twitter describing the effects of my mind is going and it's hard to concentrate. I don't even remember saying this. So that that's what fever does to when you when you're feverish, it's really like that. So it's just I, I lived over 30 years without getting a heavy influenza like that. And it's weird when you So I had the shivers. Oh no, must continue to make Game of Thrones commentary. So that's what happened there. But back on point here, the Shivers hit Westeros 60 years after the Targaryen conquest, and the big question we're presented with is, why is it that Westeros apparently didn't have continent-wide epidemics on this scale before? That the World of Ice and Fire, all these other things, don't really describe major epidemics before this. This was something new. Well, I don't know if Martin intended this or not, but the answer seems pretty logical. It was as a direct result of the Targaryen unification, the long peace which brought an unprecedented growth in population, trade, and travel. I, I've made other videos noting the world-building info we got in Fire and Blood on the history and development of their government and society. The Targaryen unification had a huge impact on that, on their society. You know, compare this to, like, what different parts of Europe were like before and after being unified by the Roman Empire and the trade networks they became a part of compared to just a few centuries before that. For example, like how the Targaryens changed things. Uh, the book, unrelated to disease, the book says that fishing as an industry used to be rare and dangerous because the Ironborn were always raiding fishing ships. But because the Targaryens put an end to that, there was this society-wide shift that fish became widely available to commoners for the first time ever. So they have this cultural holdover that fish used to be seen as a food of just the rich for thousands of years, and it's only relatively recently in the past 300 years that it became a food of the commoners. This the ripple effects you see of all the Seven Kingdoms uniting in peace like that. Well, there's a point in Fire and Blood that states that because of this long Targaryen peace, by the time of Aegon the Conqueror's grandson Jaehaerys, 50 to 60 years after the conquest, the total population of Westeros had doubled in 50 to 60 years. Fully doubled. Because all the internal wars between the different independent Seven Kingdoms were over, they had stopped people were free to focus on trade and build new towns. It said there's this unprecedented burst in 
uh, felling forests, building new towns that really hadn't happened before. And imagine the societal impact of that, the economic impact, that level of growth of 100% growth in 50 years, if you'd seen that in England or France during the real Middle Ages, outright doubled. Except in Dorne, of course, the Targaryens glassed Dorne, but it isn't wise to taunt a dragon. On top of that, Jaehaerys built the massive royal highway network, as it was known in later centuries. Westeros didn't have major overland highways before this, stretching back thousands of years to the Long Night. Why would the independent Kingdom of the Reach and Kingdom of the Stormlands have a major highway between them when they were pervasively at war with each other? But when the Targaryen unification brought peace, they could now build major highways across Westeros to boost trade. The King's Road, from Storm's End to King's Landing and then on to Winterfell and the Wall, Jaehaerys built the King's Road. Also, the Rose Road, linking Old Town to High Garden and then on to King's Landing, built that too, along with all the other major highways, crisscrossing the continent. The entire major highway network that characters use in the War of the Five Kings simply didn't exist before the Targaryen conquest, nor for a while after that, until the time of Aegon's grandson. So a major difference if you ever did a Targaryen conquest TV show, distinct from a Dance of the Dragons TV show, is if you did a conquest show, it, the early chapters of Fire and Blood emphasize just how slowly armies moved around the continent before they had the major highway network. I consider War of the Five Kings, Rob Stark is able to take his army south down the King's Road fairly quickly to get to River Run. Contrast this with his ancestor, King Torin Stark, during the conquest, last of the Stark Kings, going down the same path he uh, went south to the banks of the Trident River, near River Run, pretty much the same path, and it took him a lot longer, because he didn't have a highway. He had muddy tracks and, and swampy paths, which was such slow going that by the time he got to the south, the, the Targaryens had already pretty much won. They'd beaten all of the other southern kingdoms, so... Torin surrendered without a fight. He realized, I, I've already lost, everyone else is already defeated. Just imagine the difference if there had been a highway network in place that he could have raced his army south to maybe link up with the Lannisters and the Gardeners at the Field of Fire and make a bigger united front against them or attack them in, in their rear on two fronts. But you, they had more trouble coordinating army movements, which were a lot slower because of that. And this extends into the wars of Magor the Cruel and the Faith Militant Uprising. It, when you get into those sections, that armies are moving very slowly in those. It takes half a year to get from one point to another, to Old Town. And the, it affects how they coordinate where their campaigns are going before they have the highways. So you have to factor that in. The, the, the difference to having a big highway network makes. So what I'm saying is, the change on a societal level that the Targaryen unification brought, an unprecedented era of peace and population growth, population doubled. On top of that, trade and travel were drastically increasing, both internally and externally. They had the new highway network that was still being expanded but growing, and also, it's mentioned that because of this economic boom and the peace it brought, they were drastically increasing foreign trade with the free cities and the summer isles and other lands. It was really increasing in the major ports, that they were stimulating uh, trade in the ports. You know, King's Landing was an entirely new big port city on top of that. So, all of this increased trade and travel. Well unprecedented population boom and boom in internal travel as well as external travel, it seems that these were the perfect conditions for a major continent-wide epidemic to spread for the first time, that these conditions never existed before on this scale. 
this much easy travel, trade, population. Before the conquest, if a major disease broke out in the Reach, it wouldn't rapidly spread to the Vale or to the North, other rival independent kingdoms that they weren't heavily trading with, that didn't have highways with. Fire and Blood even briefly mentions, it's hard to read into this, it says, this wasn't even the first time the Maesters had encountered a disease like the Shivers. They'd known of diseases like this since a century before. It doesn't go into much detail on that, but there had been diseases like this, but nothing that was this lethal that was allowed to spread this fast. I think part of that is, well, the difference is a hundred years ago, there wasn't all this free travel and higher population. So, yeah, I think Martin's intent was that the shivers spread when it did during this big era of peace and, and travel as an ironic side effect of the Targaryen unification. I'm not sure if he did, he'd have to state that he did that on purpose, but it fits really well. That That's why something like that would happen. 